<laughs> okay. Um, so, um, this plenary is, is actually, can we talk about transverse directions? And, um, well, of course, um, we have south, north, east, west, local, global, and of course we do observe all of them. Yeah, actually, I think the global system is right now crisscrossed uh, by ideas which are traveling from north to south, south, north, south, south, whatever. And um, if you look at um, these globalization economists, then one of the most prominent ones, uh, Baldwin, is right now propagating an idea where globalization is, is happening in three stages. And these three stages are, first we have goods which are traveling, then we have ideas which are traveling, and we are right now in the middle of this ideas traveling stage, and then finally it will be people which are traveling. I don't know what, how that shall be, it's something like uh, Starship Enterprise, you know, um, uh, beaming stuff. But we are still in the ideas traveling age. That's the understanding here. So, so postulation is we, we do have uh, ideas which are crisscrossing over the globe. Um, and then the next question, of course, must be um, can we ide identify some general principles? Why ideas are, are traveling? Um, what are the, the fundamental principles? Do we have something like natural slopes? Yeah, or gravitational forces which make ideas travel from one place to the other. Um, and, um, well, my perspective is a little bit different from, from that of, of most here uh, in this conference, so I'm, I'm looking from the perspective of economics, and I'm working for 30 years on China, so I'm very much biased in, in what I'm doing. Um, so looking at, at economics, so my perspective is always cui bono, who is profiting, who is gaining from a transfer of ideas, from policy diffusion. So actually my perspective on, on mankind is a rather negative one. Yeah? <laughs> uh, you do something only because you profit. Um, but, I mean, we are beyond neoclassical economics, which is just applied mathematics. So we have learned that there is more than just material goods. So um, that also means that institutions are not just traveling because they are transaction cost efficient, yeah? because you get a little bit more in, in material goods out of that or because there is a little bit higher productivity or efficiency. No, that's not the case. Um, there's always human agency. So human people, human entrepreneurship must always be involved and um, that of course makes the whole thing a little bit more complicated. Um, if we look at the parameters that block in institutional transfers or policy diffusions, there are a lot, and there's a huge literature on that. Uh, locked in and path dependencies, uh, network effects, technological barriers, uh, cultural incompatibilities, etc., etc., or incumbent elites uh, which are blocking uh, policy diffusion or institu institutional transfers simply because they want to stay in power, because they want to keep their they're, they're gripped to the, to the national welfare. So that means slopes are not enough, and uh, we need entrepreneurs. And these, of course, especially on the receiving side, yeah, on that side, which is hosting um, institutional transfers, uh, because these entrepreneurs must prepare the ground, they must push these ideas um, in, the, in the host economy. I'm, I'm showing you a few slides through which I've been rushing through uh, two days ago, these are just stylized ideas yeah, um, of generic drivers of entrepreneurship and institutional transfer. And I, I just want to say uh, we have systemic competition. So that means um, we have a situation where, where one community constituency feels inferior vis-a-vis -vis another one and where some entrepreneurs, where some national elites feel the need to, to, stay, to, to change in order to stay in power in the face of an uh, overwhelming political, economic, military might which uh, they are facing. Then, of course, uh, we have the internal power struggle. That means certain elites in a, in a community try to instrumentalize foreign institutions in order to strengthen their position at home or to push their ideas, to push their ideals. Yeah, the, whatever that might be. That might be anti-corruption, but it might also simply be the idea 
let me get the largest cake, uh, sh uh, piece of the cake. And finally, we've got this, this notion of international integration. And um, here we've got eventually the idea of a cooperation game. Yeah? You see, if you join forces, uh, if you work together, you can increase the cake. So here we've got something which is not a zero-sum game, but you try to increase the cake and profit from that. And you as an elite hope to profit even more. Okay? So this can be done by, by means of a top-down degree of the, of the ruling elites, or it can be driven by bottom-up developments. Actually, in China, since 1990s, you see a lot of these bottom-up developments directly in this uh, context. Um, now, if you look at, at entrepreneurship from the sending side, well, of course, there also must be something. A wish to proactively uh, um, proselytize your ideas, your norms, to make a larger group of people follow your ideals, uh, um, prepare the ground for the governance systems of your companies, your business models, whatever. Yeah? So there is also an entrepreneurial element there to push your ideas. And once again, we can also talk here about issues like anti-corruption, gender equality, or whatever. Yeah? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give an example there. Um, so if we are abstracting from development agencies, yeah, just look at, at nation states, um, then we have here the, the idea of proactively promoting own co concepts abroad, and that, of course, depends on differentials in economic, political, military might. Yeah? So this is, this is one of these, these issues. You, I mean, let's take a small, small country in Europe, let's take Liechtenstein. Um, sorry, I have some problems in identifying Liechtenstein as a, as a big sender of ideas, simply because it's too small. Yeah? They might have very good ideas, but they, they don't have the, the inertia. Um, now let's take a closer look at, at China. And I think um, in the last couple of decades, I'm going to give you a 180 years review, uh, we find examples for all of these four categories, these types of entrepreneurships, these, these uh, types of stylized um, institutional transfer situations. Uh, and eventually we will have to, to answer the question, what has transformed China from a primar primarily receiving um, entity to one which is now increasingly sending out its own ideas, which is proactively trying to diffuse its own policies. Um, so let's start 180 years ago. Well, China was completely losing out uh, in systemic corruption, uh, corruption I'm saying, uh, systemic competition. Yeah? Opium wars, I mean, everybody was involved. You see the, uh, uh, the Brits, the Germans, the French, the, 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 uh, the, the Tsarist regime, the Japanese, everybody was there and trying to get a slice of the Chinese pizza. And what have we seen at that time in, in China? It's, it's been certainly a, tra a forced transfer by the forced transfer, which what was not really received in the first couple of decades. You have this notion of Zhongguo, yeah? China, the middle of the universe. What do we need this crappy stuff coming from the West? Okay, they've got some cannons, they've got some guns which are better than ours. Let's try to copy the guns. But, well, then they went to war and they realized that's not enough. You have to have a larger uh, copying uh, assimilation process there. So that failed for many, many decades and, and China was economy-wise going down. Um, you have a lot of intellectual resistance and only very, very slowly you find intellectual acceptance that something has to be changed. So once again, that was not a top-down uh, top thing, but it was bottom-up. And uh, what we find here is the first wave of Chinese intellectuals staying abroad, going to America, going to Europe, learning these Western concepts. Yeah? Learning Marxism, actually, at that time already, but also learning Western democracy, Western political systems, Western business models, etc., etc. And these people later on became the harbingers of more successful institutional transfers in the 1920s, 1930s, etc. But still, uh, I don't want to go into history that didn't work out. We had a lot of warfare there. Um, and then 19, 1949, 1960, uh, institutional transfers in China 
<laughs> based on internal power struggles, stakeholder interests, the ruling elite was looking for Moscow in order to, to find something that could stabilize their grip to power. You see, with a little help from the CCCP, uh, uh, Yung Hong, the Yo Yi, that simply means eternal friendship. This eternal friendship lasted until 1960, then it was over. And um, what China had been copying or transferring from the United States, from, from the CCCP during that, that time, actually was copied with massive adaptations. Um, we all usually have the idea that China was completely copying the, the Soviet model. No, absolutely wrong. Soviet Union was, was planning thousands and thousands of goods. China has never, never ever planned more than a couple of hundreds. And the rest was organized in gray markets. So there was a lot of Chineseness in these uh, institutional transfers and policy diffusions uh, coming from, from Russia, uh, from the uh, Soviet Union. Then, 20 years of isolation. So that was still north-south. Then a period of isolation and China's ideas of a south-south sending mission. Uh, you probably know that better than I, that, but try, China was trying to position itself as a speaker of the third world, of less developed economies, and well, they weren't that, that much welcomed at that time, so it also did not really work out. So China during 20 years was very much isolated. I used to, to tell my students at that point in time, it was of absolutely no consequence if China was on the, on the earth or on the other side of the moon, it had no impact on the global system, on the global economic system, I have to say. Okay, now, and now we, we come a little bit more to the present, and then China was starting to look to the West. Um, systemic co uh, competition, once again. Internal power, uh, yep. Internal power struggle, Deng Xiaoping and his reform fraction coming to power. And in his very, very famous speech in December 1977, he was actually telling the, the whole Communist Party elite, hey, listen, We've done a great job. Uh, we've eliminated um, a class struggle. We've eliminated the bourgeoisie. But the price we had to pay was we have run our economy against the wall. Our economy is no longer able to meet the material needs of our society. And that's more or less a quote. So, um, so he was actually therefore looking for a way to change the economic system and bring economics into a, to primacy. Until then, class struggle was, was political primacy. From 1978 onwards, economic development was primacy of all political deeds. And um, now you see this wonderful uh, propaganda poster. It's, it's from Shenzhen, and everybody understands reform 1978, uh, special economic zones, export processing, but that was only actually a very small component. That was copied from Taiwan and Singapore, Southern Korea. But the bulk of reforms from 1978 to 85 was actually uh, institutional transfers from historical experiences in the Comic Con countries and in Khrushchev uh, Soviet Union because these institutions were much closer to, to the state of affairs in China. They, they were much more compatible. Yeah? They could not simply go to, to Wall Street and say, now we copy your stuff. No, they weren't prepared for that. They were prepared to look for Hungarian reform economy institutions, but not for Wall Street. So they took a couple of years um, working with these templates, of course adapting them to the Chinese uh, situation, and... Um, um, and moving on. Now, okay, uh, 85 to 2010, China orienting itself completely to, to the West, uh, very, very smart way of, of, uh, of transferring institutions from the rest, very selective, very smart filtering, and very strong adaptation to uh, Chinese needs and interests. One of my very first jobs, um, was at the IFO Institute for Economic Research, and what I did is actually we, we transferred as a developmental aid project the IFO business cycle indicator um, technology to China. Thinking, okay, we provide them with some means to, or the, the companies, a better decision-making tool to, 
to structure your production processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then after two years, we realized what we had done was actually not disseminated to the, to the companies. It was not the, the, the boards of companies which received this information, but it was the politicians. So the data became secret. It was NABU, and it was a means to uphold the political power of the Communist Party who took this as, a, as an information tool to steer the, the economy and, and conduct industrial policy. So they, they just changed it in the way they, they needed it in their, in their system. So, uh, of course, during that time, China was riding the wave of, of the global value chain fragmentation, yeah, of, of offshoring, etc., and was, they were in a piecemeal fashion uh, integrating itself into the global system and taking over more and more of those elements which it thought um, to, be, to be helpful. And then, of course, finally, uh, 2010 onwards, we see that China is increasingly becoming a sender of institutions and, and policies. Uh, one point I would like to stress is uh, China has been a, a member of WTO for more than 15 years, a member of G20. If you look at China's activities in these organizations, you will not see a very strong advances of China to change these institutions. They have always been changing a little bit at the margin, trying to push a little bit, but hardly anything. So they stayed in these institutions. They never tried to change them. Yeah? Only now we see uh, at, at some other fronts, at some, uh, in, some, in some other areas, we see that China is aggressively pushing for change. Uh, we see development planning being uh, sent to other economies, Ethiopia, Senegal, African countries. The Chinese special economic zones concept is being distributed in Russia. We have a PhD student doing that to Iran, to Egypt, to many countries. So trying to disseminate this idea of, of special economic zones as developed in China. We see packages of Chinese official developmental aid and, of, um, and outward foreign direct investment, which come in packages, very importantly. Um, we, we are going to get this new super ministry for ODA, for developmental aid from China, and of course we have here the Belt and Road, oops, time is up, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is um, a big, big thing and um, is more than just a transportation corridor, but is the idea to construct a new industrial fabric. A new industrial fa fabric, which of course shall be designed according to Chinese ideas. So you see all these Chinese industrial zones there. You see that most of trade is factored in RMB. These countries have RMB in their foreign exchange reserves, et cetera, et cetera. So we are talking about a huge hegemonial uh, idea to, to propagate Western ideas in, in territories um, which until recently were a little bit out of focus of, of Europe and, and the United States. So it's a little bit carte blanche uh, for China. One final sentence. Uh, a very important parameter I would like to, to add here is actually the elite, the coming elite of these countries is right now educated in China. If you go to the universities in China, you will see hundreds, dozens and hundreds of people from Tajikistan, from Kazakhstan, from all these Belt and Road economies, which are edu being educated in China, uh, getting affinity for China, and who are going to become ambassadors of Chinese modes uh, and institutions in the next couple of years. So there's more to come from China. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. No, uh, why, why should there, there be a divide? I mean, um, uh, it's all um, uh, social sciences. So we are all dealing with, with people. And what we are doing is just we are looking at, from, at it from different angles. So it should be possible to, to get an even better picture by combining these perspectives. So actually what we are doing in Duisburg for more than 10 years already is trying to, to create interdisciplinary research uh, groups. We've done that for, for risk shifts, we're doing it for, for innovation. And um, we are bringing in there economists, um, political scientists, sociologists, city planners, engineers, and we 
we try to bring them together on a common topic. And this can be very, very hard sometimes because you must tolerate uh, other ideas, you must try to listen and try to establish bridges to your own ideas. This can be really, really, really hard. But uh, what we have realized, uh, the precondition is that in the beginning you must determine uh, a common denominator. And in Duisburg we have decided that the common denominator should be institutional theories. So all these people we bring together are united by focusing on institutional theories from sociology, from political science, from economics, etc. And that brings, creates a common language. At least we have a language in which we can exchange ideas. And everything else is simply taking time. <laughs>